thinking about ethics and thinking about theology, I think it does matter to God how we use this technology and that's obvious, but like, oh, let's be more specific. Okay, how do we use it? How can we use this for good? Okay, can we use language models to cheat on tests? Yes. Can we do bad things with it? Yes. Can we use it to help with Bible translations that, Hmm. you know, there's no, can we build models that will help indigenous peoples translate the Bible into their language? Is AI a threat to faith or an opportunity for the church? Get ready for a thought-provoking conversation. I'm Bill Gorman, campus pastor at the Brookside Campus. And I'm Paul Brandis, campus pastor at the Shawnee Campus. And today on the Form.Life podcast, Dr. Joshua K. Smith joins us to continue a conversation we're having at Christ Community about artificial intelligence. And Joshua is a theologian researching the ethics of AI and robotics who, after a season of pastoring a local church, now works in cybersecurity. He earned a THM and PhD in theology from Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and he's also the author of two books, Robot Theology, Old Questions Through New Media, and Robot Persons, Our Future with Social Robots. Yeah, we first encountered Dr. Smith's work through Dr. John Dyer, who has joined us here on the podcast and was with us here in person to discuss these topics of technology and AI. Make sure you visit cckc.church slash AI to find those resources and more on this vital topic. Yeah, and whether you are a regular user of AI tools or a complete novice, the question that Josh is helping us to navigate in this conversation are relevant to all of us. So let's jump in right now. Josh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, We're so delighted to get to have this conversation with you today. We're just really grateful for your time. Yeah. Thanks, guys, for having me. Yeah. Well, back on episode 29 of the podcast, we interviewed a theologian from Dallas Theological Seminary named John Dyer. And it was in a conversation with John as we were talking about these topics of theology and faith and technology um, that he first uh, mentioned your name to us, Josh. And so we're so delighted to get to have this conversation with you. This is an ongoing conversation we're having as a church. And so um, you can actually, we'll put a link to this in the show notes, but there's a, a page on our website that's kind of a hub for uh, resources around the topics of faith and technology and even particularly faith and artificial intelligence and that kind of a a conversation. So as we begin this part of that conversation today, um, Josh, I'd love to know what inspired you to explore the intersection of theology and artificial intelligence and what does that journey look like so far Mm. for you? Yeah, it's kind of a, a long story. Um, you know, I don't come from a long line of pastors or theologians or anything really other than like trade workers, but I've always been kind of alone, curious about things. And so I was telling you guys earlier, I was the kid that took everything apart. It's a miracle that I wasn't electrocuted as a kid <laughs> because I really would just kind of dive into things. And I've always just been curious about things. I remember... This was before everybody had a PC in their house. I didn't grow up with the internet in my home. Didn't grow up with cell phones. So just had to be curious and take things apart. So any new technology was just going to get disassembled, uh, <laughs> I love unfortunately. That. So I apologize to my grandmother. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think once I started getting heavily into tech was around high school, started doing some programming and networking stuff and really got big into robots. And so that was where the questions started. And then worked with some robots in the military, got out, got into my theological education. And if you fast forward to my PhD, that when the question of personhood kind of came up and I wanted to explore more about some of the AI that I've worked with in the past and some of the other aspects of it that just weren't there. And so this was around the time too that the ERLC's statement of principles on AI was coming out and uh, that's the ethics and religious liberty yeah. community. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of Southern Baptist. Yeah, connected yes. with the yes. SBC. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of headed up by Jason Thacker, yeah. uh, who's a friend and uh, a scholar. And so we, we had several conversations about that. And I had a completely different trajectory for the research I was going to do and just kind of fell into the robotics ethics and 
AI debates, but then just kind of fell in love with the people. Mm. And so that's what made me stay. Yeah. And made a lot of great friends and uh, colleagues. But I mean, really, it's just a really small community of people. And I wanted to build on that and grow it. And so I just started writing and absolutely zero people were interested in what I had to say. (laughs) (laughs) And every publisher was like, this will never be a conversation for the next five to 10 years. And then you fast forward, like literally two years later, Wow! um, it everywhere and it's permeated everything. And I think that question has been ongoing since the fifties about what is the intersection of our life with technology. And it's been so pervasive. We just haven't really had time to step back and think about it. So I'm grateful that AI is finally getting talked about in the local church because whether or not you know it, you use it every day. Yeah. And it also uses you Hmm. as a product to, it's kind of like this cycle of we give it information, it gives us information. And so the big thing that always comes up is like, well, what, how is it different? And yeah. that's kind of what we got into in the research. And so that's really where I just became fascinated about deconstructing it and putting it back together and exploring how theology might be a part of that conversation. And I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more, like when we ask that question, how is, how is it different? I'd love to talk a little bit about that. But I wonder even before we go there, if you could even just give an example, you, you say yeah, we use... Ev- AI every day, whether we know it or not, and it's using us. But what might be a way uh, that we're using AI that we don't even realize? Like, what's a, give us just a couple of examples there. Yeah, you know, you're, I think the biggest thing is probably how we're being targeted through advertisements and not necessarily like generative AI. There's, there's different facets of it, right? Right. But as far as how it's being used against you or for you, however you want to look at it, is basically how products are pushed to you, the things that are recommended to you. And we've known for a long time that you see thousands and thousands and thousands of ads every day. But let's just let's just like be very practical for a second when you're on Instagram or social media and you know that you've had a conversation about this with your spouse or whoever and then you suddenly get an advertisement for that because everything is spying on you and sending that information back to you this big data sets that nobody's really managing, right? Because it's all just some kind of big blob of information, but that's being automated to push you different choices. Mm -hmm. So the the big question for us is, you know, how much information do we want to give knowing that there are already data sets on our children, on decisions that we've made. So it's almost like this predictive pattern that you paid for a, these companies like to say, okay, you purchased these things. So it's connected into your banking, connected into all of your social media platform, connected into healthcare. Uh, I mean, just every facet of your life at some point or another will touch some type of data lake, some type of machine learning. Um, and companies use that not to necessarily take advantage of you, um, although that's where it's been going, but I think it's just a part of the natural progression of technology as we try to make decisions faster and we have more consumers, we have more products who just try to augment humans. And so it's a fascinating conversation um, about whether or not we should do that. And we have these tests in our life, like, okay, what do I value more? Do I value human connectedness? Do I value uh, the work and trade of a human? Or do I just want the product faster and cheaper? And so sometimes those are exclusive to each other. Sometimes they're not. And we don't really know all the different pieces of where that's connected. Um, And that's just like the very tip of data privacy, that conversation and how vast it is in our life. but yeah, I, I don't know a place that it doesn't touch right. really, right? Um, unless you just don't have smart tech, right? Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Well, when you mentioned the different kind of facets of AI, I wonder if we could even step back and zoom out a little bit uh, because it is uh, a multifaceted uh, conversation and piece of technology, which is even probably a t- too narrow of a word. How might you, for uh, listeners that are 
extremely familiar or not familiar at all, how would you go about helping them even get started in this? Like, what would be a definition you could put around AI or one that you've used just to help people that are coming to yeah. it with, again, we've got very familiar listeners and users and then people that are coming to this conversation with hardly any context except now learning that it, it integrates with almost every aspect of their online life. Yeah. I don't know that I've said or formulated or have heard a really good explanation for what AI is. I don't know that we'll ever get one because, and this is not a political answer, but because of how the conversation was formed back in the 1950s, artificial intelligence is a misnomer. That doesn't mm. make any sense. If you really think about it, intelligence cannot be artificial. That doesn't make any sense. But I th what people mean by that, I yeah. think, is that it's alien to the human. Like it's not doing logic the way that our wet neural nets do logic and the way that we process information. So maybe think about it that way, where how we see animals process information differently. Well, so does a machine. It also processes things differently. I think more similar to um, animals, right? I think Kate Darling's work on this has really helped me frame it a little bit better because what we want to do as, you know, Creatures made in the Imago Dei, creatures who are made in the likeness of God. We see everything through a mirror and we want to reflect that onto our creations. And that's just not true, right? I think they're very distinct, unique creations, just like we're not the same as a dog. We're not the same as an ape, right? I think we are distinct. And so, and that could be a very heated conversation just right there, but sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But yeah, just I think about it differently now. It, it, there's different layers of AI. There's different, even I think people that use it and developers and software designers, how they use it. Sometimes I, I'm listening in meetings. I'm like, I'm not sure I would just describe AI that way because what you mean by that is machine learning, that mm -hmm. we give it a bunch of data sets, we give it A, B, and C and say, find dogs and cats that are, you know, native to Mississippi. Okay, so give it all these data sets and it'll figure it out, right? It's kind of like baking a cake, um, which is an analogy I stole from David Gunkel. You put the ingredients in and it's gonna give you a cake, right? That's low level machine learning, you know, kind of very simplistic AI. Um, but there is something beyond that, that most people don't realize is that, you know, the question of large language models and chat GPT, that's not really AI. <laughs> and so that's not what uh, computer scientists are actually working towards. It's just giving you a bigger, that's just a recipe, right? You give it a cake and it's been trained or you give it a recipe and it gives you a cake. It, it's got all these different data sets. It's been trained for years before it gets to you. Um, but real AI, you know, it's uh, general AI is it's something totally different that we don't really understand because it is distinct. And what I mean by that is like, it makes decisions that we don't understand and you can give it these data sets and you could tell it how to solve a problem and then it might solve it completely differently in a way that we would never think about it. And so that's both a, a scary thing for some people, but also a beautiful thing because if it's used properly, Right? If it's used in the right ethical framework and moral framework, it might solve some of our bigger problems. Not all of them. There's still sin. That's what yeah. I try to help designers understand. It's like there's still brokenness. It will never be a perfect creation. But it might help us as we try to navigate mm. um, finding cures for different diseases or helping kids with autism. Um, it, there's all types of different things that these machines can help us with that are very positive and I think very God glorifying, but then the same models and the same uh, machine learning underneath it can be used for very destructive things. Mm -hmm. So we've got to, even if we don't really understand how to answer that question, we, we have to be a part of the conversation. Right. And so I'm not here to say I know everything about it. I don't know anybody else in this conversation <laughs> that knows everything about it but we're, we're trying to have a conversation and, and build the table out mm -hmm. and say, we need as many people as possible to come to this conversation 
as scientists, as pastors, as politicians, as teachers, as moms and dads to say, these are things that we're concerned about. What is this product doing? What is this? Um, can we at least have a conversation about it? But now it's so intricate to our life. Um, we, I don't know that we have much say in it, but I do think we can begin to shift the waters back a little bit, hopefully, um, as we try to maybe fill in some gaps that we've missed over the last 50 to 100 years. So that's, that's not all that you asked. No, that's really, oh, it's really helpful. And I, I heard in the midst of that, um, you know, kind of some key terms uh, as well that are uh, very, a little bit more widely known than they were however many months or years ago. So large language models, chat GPT, again, so kind of some key uh, terms within the conversation more recently, but I'm also hearing you say, well, that's, you know, I'm, I'm correct me, but hearing that is more like, that's a little bit more like machine learning than maybe what, I don't remember exactly the phrase you use, but something around like pure AI or, yeah. and so yeah. can you help us even more distinguish that? Cause I think that mm -hmm. for probably just the average person that's some level at some level cued into this, they're probably equating a one for one around mm -hmm. like a chat GPT and like, Oh, yeah. that's AI. And we've been waiting for that. And here's the tool. Mm -hmm. And now AI is here and it's chat GPT. So could you bring a little more nuance <laughs> to, to that perhaps as would be helpful? Yeah. So I think when I think about more general AI, I would think about how I might have a conversation with another human and never question that are they human or not. Right. And we can be in conversations with certain types of AI, like more advanced AI, general AI, um, not super intelligent. I hate that. Like the whole conversation really, is just kind of puts us in an awkward position. But let's just say like there are, there are models out there where, and this is a debate I get into often about friendship, is that I think you could probably have a genuine friendship with some of these more advanced models Depending on how you frame friendship, and right. I do think it's it's limited, but you can have conversations with some of them. And you're like, ah, if you thought there was a human on the other side, you wouldn't know the difference. Mm -hmm. But there's some manipulation there too, right? So when you're texting on your iPhone and you see the dot, 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 right? Sometimes they'll put that in there. It's already processed the answer. It already has an output for you but they'll put that in there to make it more human-like. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's kind of crossing a barrier, I think, mm. from large language model to where it no, it's just machine learning or computer vision. So a lot of AI too, so robotic processes is a part of that. It's not doing, it's doing a lot of math. That's what it is at its core. It's doing high rate of speed math and it's giving you outputs. It's not thinking deeply about that output or weighing whether or not it should make a different route or a different choice. As we're on the other side of the threshold, it is making a thought about if you ask it, hey, what's your, what's your favorite book? What's your favorite song? Can you produce something like that for me? I think that's a little different. I'm not saying it's ever gonna be human, I don't think that's ever a part of the question for us. And we just take that off the table. It's not ever going to be human like us, but it's going to be able to do things that we cannot. Um, I can't even do general math, so I'm already <laughs> out of the game there. I was thinking the same thing, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I think just think one, it's like a really big calculator, uh, kind of like dumb AI, so to speak. It's not dumb, but it's, it's like we've seen all the videos where they try to generate hands and it just really struggles with hands sometimes. It's really creepy, some of the outputs that it gives. Um, so I think that's one category to think about it, right? It's just kind of producing something that it's been formed to do versus where there have been machines that just had been stood up and turned off because it was just giving it access to the internet. And then it started making decisions about things and started um, getting different inputs from very bad places, as, as you can imagine with a child, if you gave your child, let's say an eight to 10 year old, uh, who's never had access to the internet before unfiltered, and they just kind of got in there and saw all the nitty gritty, right? You can imagine how that might shape 
that mind in one mm-hmm. particular way, mm-hmm. and it's usually mm-hmm. not good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't naturally go towards uh, the positive things on the internet. Uh, so yeah, that, that's how we think about it. So a lot of the conversations over the years too is data scientists really thought that if we just gave the right inputs, the right processes, and had the right computational power and process, we would just have human-like interactions. And that's just not true. Mm. I don't think it ever will be, but I do think it will, it'll cross a threshold where we're not really sure. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, guys, sometimes I've not been sure about people I know that are human. So I know we're going to struggle. Um, and you've probably been in a conversation at some point and not known it with some type of robotic process or, um, and I think about this too, in my own research with chatbots, they can get really convincing. It's pretty terrifying. Yeah. And some of that, some of that is imagination, like how far are we allowed to project onto the machine? Yeah, mm, that's interesting. Um, so I think it, there's always going to be this blurry gray line. Like I don't, I don't think it's ever going to be. It's like it's a gradient, and so you don't. It's never going to be a hard line between dumb AI and super intelligent AI. There's there's going to be some some ups and downs in the gradient, and it's going to be darker and lighter. So just have if you have a moral framework to think about it, and which I like to think about it this way: is is this producing good? Is this the outputs that are giving are helping society for good, right? Not only is it a really great product, but is it actually producing something that is of value for society? Um, and is all the resources and minerals and mining that goes into these products, right? Because it starts on the ground. Yeah. Is it worth? Is it worth the destruction of the earth to create this product for the output that it's given? Yeah. And the amount of uh, electricity. I mean, this is a conversation around this too. I mean, these you, you kind of sit there in front of your computer and type into ChatGPT or whatever, but there's acres of computers and I don't know how much, you know, thousands of watts of energy that are going into hmm. to giving you that answer yeah. back, right? Um, yeah. It's a lot of a lot of electricity uh, to to run all those math uh, equations <laughs> <laughs> and, and keep the computers to cool do all enough, your homework right, for you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. To write those emails. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's really fascinating. I, I wonder, uh, Josh, as you're thinking about kind of, well, a, co- a couple of questions are percolating for me. One of them is, you know, as a theologian, how, what are your hopes, concerns, thoughts about kind of the, the generative AI? We're kind of talking about relationships with, with AIs, but just, any of that on on our on our spirituality or our own formation mm. uh, in in Christ likeness and being conformed to to His image, uh, I'm I'm curious what what maybe our hopes is there is there something there that wow uh, some of these tools some of these things could actually really help form us in Christ and and maybe on the other hand what are some current concerns about maybe how those might deform us or or form us mm. away yeah yeah I think some of our biggest concerns have probably been the the discipline of the mind, the life of the mind. Not, you know, Plato was concerned that the written word would destroy memory. Yeah. I think he was right. I think he was absolutely right. <laughs> and so if we if we brought him here today, I think he would might he might be more concerned about how we're using technology, how we have been using it for a long time, and how that's kind of given us some brain rot. <laughs> Just to put it in, in very familiar language, um, there's a there's an old movie cartoon that that comes from that scarred me as a child. But uh, yeah, like you know, it's not just it's not just AI. This kind of goes back to all technology and even I think conversations about the microwave, where like how many of us would be willing to take the microwave out of our house today? <laughs> I, mean, I don't I don't know. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And so I think it gets to a point in AI is will as well, and it already has been. And I think in the newest uh, iOS update, it's already integrated. Like I think uh, OpenAI or ChatGPT1 is already plugged into your OS. So it's becoming more of a facet in our life that we don't understand. It's kind of underlying it. So on one, on one side, I really worry that we will let it 
form us instead of forming it. Mm-hmm. It's something that is passively happening mm-hmm. to us. Mm-hmm. And know that we as consumers have a say over that. We really do. And we have, I mean, everybody has a conversation. It's not just theologians and not just data scientists, but everybody. And so I think that in, in my theological vision of, you know, thinking about ethics and thinking about theology, I think it does matter to God how we use this technology. And that's obvious, but like, oh, let's be more specific. Okay, how do we use it? How can we use this for good? Okay, can we use language models to cheat on tests? Yes. Can we do bad things with it? Yes. Can we use it to help with Bible translations that, Hmm. you know, there's no, can we build models that will help indigenous peoples translate the Bible into a language if they so desire? Is there, are there ways that we could use it for our humanitarian good? Are there ways that we could um, use it for sermon writing? I know this is a big topic for pastors, but yeah. uh, I have a friend who designed Pulpit AI, which I used and loved. It was not a sermon replacement technology, never was meant to be, but I could take my sermon audio from Sunday plug it into pulpit AI. That's a free plug. <laughs> and it would generate content like devotionals, uh, conversation guides. And that would, for the for a pastor who was like me in a smaller context, that was so life-giving because it freed up yeah. lots of hours of trying to write devotional material, to trying to keep up with social media content, to even just having it playing with it. Um, there's one called the Open Bible AI. It's completely free, but it will go in and it's the older version of ChatGPT that it was trained on the Bible. Look up any verse and it will generate an exegetical guide. It will generate discussion questions. And so I even played with that in, in our church, you know, just to see if people would know the difference if I wrote it or if an AI wrote it. Yeah. And most of the time people just didn't look enough to care or yeah. to see. So. Paul, you should tell I, I, on that. I just want to pause you right there, Joshua, because uh, you know Jacob, who's one of our pastoral residents for our listeners, he's in the studio with us uh, off camera, but he did a little something like this yes. on a Sunday morning. You got to tell the story, Paul. Well, yeah, yeah we had, uh, you know, Jacob uh, is a, is an uh, active user and experimenter, and it's been kind of fun on our staff to uh, have him step into that. And Josh, what he did was we had a moment, uh, a sixth grade, uh, like kind of Bible uh, milestone moment where parents were giving Bibles. And I had said, Jacob, I would like you to do the prayer for these families afterwards. And we, and our staff meeting, were just talking about how well, you should have AI write a prayer and you can write a prayer and then you can show it to us and we'll all guess which one you wrote and which one AI wrote. And he, he cheated. Josh is what he did <laughs> because yeah. he fed all of his scripts into AI and then had it write the prayer in his own voice. So we all, we all failed the test except for one yeah. of our staff. Uh, so I don't know that that's that actually crazy? cheating, but we had a good time with it. Uh, yeah. And he, he just for all the listeners out there, he prayed his own prayer. He did not pray the AI. <laughs> he did not pray the AI prayer. So, but yeah. yes, we similarly have kind of had some of those, some fun hmm. with that. Yeah. But we've yeah. also had that where you've taken a sermon and uh, you put that into, you paste the entire sermon into ChatGPT or something and then say, write a, uh, a closing prayer um, in the style of the Book of Common Prayer based on the sermon. Mm-hmm. And then whether you're the, then you can edit that prayer. But I mean, I know some of our campuses have, have done that and it's like, oh, this is, this is really helpful. Um, even if it's just a template for, for a, st- a starting place. Um, yeah. 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 I have more extreme views too. Like I know that people are with me on that one, but I've even gone so far as to think about how it might be used for people who are isolated and lonely, mm. um, you know, and there's just not much out there to, there's just so many different spaces where I see a positive use for good um, that people are exploiting for bad that we could use it for good. And uh, I think about uh, one of the early like tests, like Paul talks about testing of the spirits. Yeah. One of the early tests for the, the early church was, does, do you ask for money? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that's just funny to me because all these different models and stuff like, this stuff should be free. I think some of it is. And 
there are ways that we could build this technology. The technology costs, right? The infrastructure behind it costs money, but producing a prompt should not cost people a certain amount of money a month, I think. Um, so just thinking about ways that you might provide a service for somebody that either has a learning disability, mm -hmm. speech disability, like there's mm -hmm. so many different areas that we could focus on as a local church uh, with a missionary lens to think about how could we use technology for the good of the kingdom? Because I think if Paul were here, you know, yeah, he'd have a lot of concerns, but I think he would also say, I'm going to use this thinking technology to every bit that I can so that people could hear the gospel. Like think about how many letters more Paul would have written if we had like, I mean, he kind of was a language model. Like I just think about, you know. <laughs> yeah, trained in the Torah. Like, yeah, it's just being able to write different letters, three or four letters at one time. I mean, that was the thing. That's so weird to me to be able, like so many different yeah. layers of thought. Well, but, and even um, like within that, I mean, he used an amanuensis almost. I mean, we were pretty oh. sure it's like a, which is a, someone that he was, art, you know, yeah. speaking and someone else was writing for him. Right. That's why you get in some of his letters and now I, Paul, write in my own mm -hmm. hand. But it's sort of like a version, a, tech, a technology of the day. I mean, I know it's like a use of another yeah. person in that space, but I'm fat. I, I agree. And I'm fascinated by even how he might have done that in his you know, kind of moment in his Monday work and world. So, but what, uh, as you think about Josh, cause that's certainly, uh, something we're interested in, in terms of churches, uh, helping and directing these kinds of technologies toward the common good and the flourishing of all people and, uh, the advancement of God's kingdom and more and more coming to declare Christ how can churches and pastors be helpful and what safeguards mm -hmm. should we be advocating for? You know, the apostle Paul yeah. would have concerns. I think we all also have concerns, but uh, God's power of redemption uh, over all things, including any and all technologies is vast. And um, so how can we, how can churches and pastors be helpful and what safeguards maybe even in that should mm. we be ad advocating for? Yeah, there's so much to that question. <laughs> it's a great question, but I think first and foremost is to to be active in the conversation, which is to be a front runner for the funding of some of this research. There are a lot of Christians at places like Google and hmm. I mean, you'd be surprised. There are, there are believers in these spaces, but I've always found it fascinating. Like, you know, so I was a part of the Southern Baptist Convention for a long time. I, I don't associate with them anymore, but you know, I used to ask people and it would drive them mad, like, okay, we're giving this money here, we're giving this money here, like how much money have we given to the societal good of say like cancer research? Hmm. I know that's a, maybe that's unfair, but okay, it's like, like we, wanna, we wanna reach lost people. Like, you know, do you wanna be involved in the tech conversation? Do you wanna be in that space? Yeah. Well, first and foremost, you have to buy into it. And I think for a long time, we've had this monastic view about technology. And we, I still see it a lot in our language where we're kind of hypocritical because it consumes everything in our life. It's a part of our life where we're cyborgs to an extent, I think. <laughs> yeah. And I would include that like all the way down to like medicine and different things that augment the body and biochemistry. And so if it's for healing, if it's for good, I think it's of God. I think it can be of God, put it that way. So. Why wouldn't we give church dollars? Why wouldn't we directly be involved? And I know this is a big, messy conversation, but why wouldn't we be directly involved in the formation of these spaces? Mm -hmm. And the truth is we're just too scared. We don't understand what that partnership looks like and we secluded ourselves from it. Hmm. Um, and it's awkward. It really is because as a pastor stepping into some of those spaces, as a theologian stepping into those spaces for like, why are you here? <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, no, I'm, I'm a maker too. Like I, I make mm, things and I like mm, doing mm. these things and I'm, I'm a part of this. And I think their natural reaction to you is what are you doing here? And so I think first and foremost, we've just got to be part of the community again, understanding that, and there's like very simple things you can do. Everybody's trying to learn more about tech. There's just very pragmatic, practical things we could do for people in our community who are struggling, 
Um, there's, believe it or not, still people who don't have internet. Yeah. And um, yeah. I, I can't take credit for this idea, but during the pandemic, the early days when everybody was um, secluded, isolated, you know, what was the one thing that connected every county in the state, like Mississippi or wherever? What, what do you think, what's one building that's almost everywhere? Churches. Yeah. Right? Like, we, I think we missed an opportunity there. Like, if we, there's so much dark fiber, like cable that's not active for high-speed internet, like churches could have opened their doors for places to use them where there was so many restrictions about meeting. Um, we've could have, there's just so many different things that we still could do that mm -hmm. relates to data transformation and connecting to the community and being places where it's just a place to make and be and exist. And I think we're so scared of that conversation because we do want to like control it, but it's very messy. Now, all mm -hmm. these ideas, it's very messy but that's how I think about it when I think about technology is what could we do to benefit the good community with the space that we have? Um, we have so much space. Like we literally are connected all over the United States. If you look at churches and our buildings and different things. Um, and so I'm just asking this question myself and how can we explore giving back and being a part of that conversation? Then I think the second piece of it is actually making things. Hmm. I think we've we, we become so much a consumer mindset of, um, you know, I heard this one pastor recently, I don't remember his name, but he was talking about the Dead Sea and how it has all these different ingestion points. And the reason why it's dead is just because it ingests and it never pushes out. Yeah. Maybe that's a terrible analogy, but yeah. I really like that because <laughs> it reminded me of Paul. He is talking about giving and the measure of my Christianity and, and my heart is how much do I give to other people? It's not how much do I consume or how many Bible studies are I'm in, how many sermons that I listen to. And that hurts the pastor's feeling, but it's really like not about the dollar amount that you tithe, not, not about none of those things, but like, are you a cheerful giver of your time, of your resources? Like, are you, are you cheerfully giving that back to God's kingdom? And I think that involves tech as well. Um, and I, I just want to have those dangerous conversations to a point where like, like how far can we push this? And I think it definitely touches the finance field, um, the healthcare industry. Yeah. There's so many places where this stuff is an ingestion point, but the primary ethic that's driving it is greed. And so it's not just, okay, we need to make cool stuff and we need to figure out how to use it, but like we need to have some control points and pinch points where we're like, no, right. that, that's bad. That is actively exploiting a child, that is actively exploiting the elderly. We, that, that is a no-go. Yeah. And yeah. I'm surprised, honestly, guys, that there aren't more people upset and in arms with our administration and governments to say, we don't want that data captured on our children. We don't want like, it's, it's not even a debate anymore that social media is so harmful to girls at a yeah. certain point. Like yeah. it should not be in their possession and yeah. they it should not push certain content to them. And even to us, right? Like, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. You having to hit the not interested button, you, if you get on there for any length of time, you're going to see Excuse me, if you're a man, you're going to see somebody who's trying to push you towards, I'm not going to say any like particular sites, but yes. they're, they're trying to push you towards a particular site yep. to generate funds. Yeah. And it favors that content because uh, it's doing the same thing that YouTube is doing. And what you're trying to do, right? When you get your content out there, you want more people to see it. And so the more people that interact with it, the more people see it. I'm not sure that's the best model. Um, and so this is just a big seismic shift of how we think about it is not just, okay, is it bad? Is it, is it good? But okay, how do we actually just have a conversation about this with people and how do we walk into that space? And then when we get in the space and build trust, we actually produce the good that we promised that we would. And so I think about 
and you want an in-depth case study, look at people like Nashley Cephas, Dr. Cephas, who is from Mississippi, who went to work at Amazon, came back, invested like $150 million into downtown Jackson, which is known for lots of bad things in terms of parts. And that's not what it is. There's, there's so much beauty and creativity mm. there. But such a beautiful picture of gospel redemption because she's taking dollars that she could have taken anywhere else. She could have took to, you know, to the Con Valley or anywhere to make lots of more money. She took it and she's putting it and in investing in a place that nobody else wants to invest in for the sake of the community and doing workshops. She's, I mean, is she out there preaching the gospel every? No, but it's a different type of ministry. Yeah. And she's more than welcome to let people who are faith-based come into that. And she is a Christian. Um, and so for me, she's a hero. Yeah. Like that's, that I think is the epitome of what Paul would be doing with the resources that he had for the good of the community. Um, well, and that- You haven't done anything else with it, right? Well, and that it's, it strikes me as like, you're talking about what kind of the primary ethic is in so many of these spaces or companies or the tools of the ethic of greed and that counter story and her case study example is like the power of the ethic of love. Yeah. Like genuine Christ centered, gospel centered love for yeah. the common good and yeah. flourishing of all. So there's a lot of, it's just, that's just really a beautiful answer. Yeah. And, well, you and what can't, I, go ahead. I was saying what I hear in your answer there too, just on, on this is it's like, I just, I hear echoes of Genesis one and two yeah. as, like our responsibility to this emerging field of technology and artificial intelligence is to do what we've always always done. been called to do, which is to uh, you, you said we got to you know put some safeguards. It was, it was like a watching over, a keeping, and then we got to make stuff. And yep. this is like this is Genesis one and two. Like we're we're cultivating and keeping, we're guarding, and it's like. And I love, I think you said something at the very beginning about this, but it's almost like the question, are, are we exercising dominion in the like the, mm-hmm. the proper healthy sense of, of this technology? Um, or is it exercising dominion over us? And, and so our engagement, like if we're not engaged, what I hear you yes, saying, if we're not engaged. Because we abdicated it, it's not uh, exercising dominion we, over us. Right? We're not able to mm-hmm. exercise right. that, yeah. that, res- yeah. that God-given responsibility um, of, of dominion. You know, it's like, should Adam have like kicked the snake out of the, the garden? Uh, and, and, you know, he, he didn't exercise that dominion and we're in that space. And so, and that, yeah, I don't know that I, I just, those Genesis one and two categories are just kind of mapping onto what you're, you're framing yeah. for me here, Josh. Yeah. So and I think it's, it's always going to be, even with a good technology we create, I think there's always a temptation for exploiting it. Yes. And I think you just, we constantly need regulate just on the more practical side. Again, this is, we need regulations around this to actually protect children. We can't expect them to That's protect right. themselves. And I think likewise with us as adults, I constantly need intervention outside of myself to say too much screen time, too much numbing, too much of, you know, whatever it is, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. I can convince myself all day that I'm basically a machine, you know, in that, but at the same time, my body rejects too much, right? Yeah, yeah that's the right. The eyes will strain and you can feel like you're having a heart attack from eye strain, which I think is wild, but there's, there's a, there is a piece to this as well, which is Sabbath. Yeah. And this, this is a big piece. Also a Genesis one and two. <laughs> it is right there. Yeah. Genesis, Genesis, yes. the conversation of Genesis yep. and the conversation of uh, technology is just so we, intertwined. We could not agree more. Yeah. And I love, I love both of those things so much, but the Sabbaths are like on Sunday, I have this idea, like a, I use the terminal a lot, right? So on the computer, there's this program called terminal and it's just a, uh, you'll see it like if you're watching a movie with hackers or whatever, like right? that's what it is. But my my logic here is like, okay, the terminal needs a rest too on Sunday. Yeah. Um, God commands the animals to rest. He commands even there are periods of rest in Genesis and in Exodus and Leviticus where it talks about letting the land breathe. Yeah. And that is a part of flourishing. So I think too we. We have to put safeguards around and I love this about Shabbat for our Jewish friends is that your technology, right? If you buy modern technology like stoves yeah. and refrigerators, they have Shabbat yeah. programmed into them. <laughs> my my <laughs> stove has a Sabbath yeah. hug. Yeah. Yeah, it should. It, it yeah. should, right? 
like there's something to that. And even I think there's a lot of psychology that backs it up, even just having a meal together. And while we gather on Sundays and Wednesdays is to disconnect from life in a way, to disconnect from the depression of life and to reconnect to one another. And not just for you, but for the other person. Yes, that's right. And man, that if you can get people to understand that, um, and I think that's a part of technology as well, is not just what can I get from this, but what can I give? And some of that giving is space, sure. Like Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, don't trust the person who cannot be alone. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, the Bible says it's not good for you to be completely isolated. There's proverbs about that. There's, again, going back to Genesis, there's a piece that says man shouldn't be alone. But that's, for me, who's, you know, people like me who are introverted and techies, we like that. We, we prefer that. We don't want to be around people. Um, and even, like, it's a struggle for me and my son who have um, some disabilities where, I don't, I don't like calling them disabilities, but certain lights and something to think about as well. Um, church, like big churches don't really do well with the spectrum. And like, if you think about the modern, I'm not saying your church or anything like that, but if you think about the church from the design and from the lens of a person who has autism, think about what that experience is like for them. Yeah. And, you know, using technology is really cool for one side, but then maybe the other side. And so I think, there's such a big piece to this and it's such a all encompassing conversation about how we do life together and how we use technology for good. And, um, I just think we, we struggle. We always will struggle with those pieces, but man, there's, there's so many different layers that I wish more churches would have that conversation and not think about it because if we're, if we're not careful, we fall into the same greed. Yes. Ethic. Yep where it's, it's in very industrialized, where like, how can we reach more people? How can we, you know, I'm saying that's bad. But put, hear, hear what I'm saying. Yeah, It's not bad. I'm just saying like, there's, there's a point where that needs to rest as well. Mm -hmm. And like, people are constantly getting information. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a disconnect at some point. They actually need to, to see you eye to eye at some point. Yeah. Um, like there's a whole process we go through as believers. And we need different things in different layers at different points at different times. And I just want to think through as a theologian, like how do we both use technology for the good of the church, but also how do we pull away pieces that are distractive, are distracting? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I, I don't know about you, and I don't know what your worship space looks like, but I've heard several people in my generation younger, it's like sometimes there's, something so beautiful about walking into a church that is just like old varnished wood mm -hmm. and there's old pews and it's just the, uh, you know, percussion instruments, uh, you know, piano and stuff like that. That brings in for me a different type of reverence than it does for the amplified sound. Yeah. So if you're interested, Marshall McLuhan wrote a book about this after he converted to Catholicism, mm. talking about how the church uses technology. And he was mostly talking about uh, amplified sound and how that sure. changes things. Yeah. So this is not just about AI. No, this is yeah. about every piece in the church, how we use the soundboard, how we modulate, like pastors, I encourage you to think through those things because yeah. it matters. Yeah. And um, it could be for, for good or for bad. So, um, I'm, I'm grateful that you guys are thinking through this. I think the church has always been reactive mm -hmm. towards technology. It wasn't always like that, but we've, we've always been reactive in, in the modern sense. But uh, I think we can change the narrative. I think there's a lot of light that we can shine in some of these darker places. We just have to be willing to, like the Apostle Paul, <laughs> sometimes be kicked out, sometimes be ridiculed, sometimes be snake bitten. <laughs> um, but always, but always be a voice of love and hope mm. and encouragement. Um, and sometimes that's not how I feel in these spaces, but 
it's what I need to give to my coworkers and to um, those who are, are struggling around me. So that's yeah. my encouragement to you. Josh, thanks so much for having this conversation with us and just sharing your your learning, your thoughtfulness, uh, and, and your just your love for the church and, and this conversation. It's really, really helpful. Um, whenever we come to the end of an episode, we always like to ask our guests. We never know the answer ahead of time, so this is always a fun part of the, the episode. But, Surprise! You know, you have done some amazing things, and you said earlier, you're 36 years old. You've already done, you were a pastor for a while. You're working in cybersecurity. Now you've got your PhD and subjects around technology and robotics, <laughs> but if you could do something else, like if you just have a different career, a different pathway uh, for your occupation, you know, I always say, oh, I'd love to be a national park ranger, just be out outside and do that. What, what would, what's your national what's park your ranger? Then, yeah. yeah. Ooh, uh, I would really like, this is a terrible answer, but um, I would really like to work in a lab, like a robotics lab. Yeah. That's was just like training different um different models on theology i think if i get to it like that ever becomes a thing like neuroscientists for robots that are used in the local church that'd be a cool job i think um Sounds so maybe maybe one day that would be a job yeah, but yeah, i don't yeah. know who knows that's amazing that's amazing wow. yeah well thank you uh so much again josh for the time and being with us today and really appreciate your presence and generosity of uh sharing yeah everything that you uh, did in this conversation so thank you so much for the time yeah yeah thanks for letting me ramble on guys i no, appreciate so it good. so good yeah, we'll have all the all the research yes. you've mentioned a number of books and yeah, references and so we'll have all that in the show notes for you to access and chase those things down so thanks again josh and uh, blessings on your work yeah thanks guys